All right, buckle up kids. Today's video is going to be a little dense and a little bit heavy, so I wore yellow just to brighten things up a bit. Hello everyone. For those of you who don't know, my major in college was linguistics and I minored in anthropology and I want to take those two degrees and figure out how language and society interact. In this video will be the first part. It will be an introduction into a broader discussion about how we use language to perpetuate inequality. Future videos will be used to go more in depth about specific examples of when and how we use language to perpetuate uh, inequality. But for this video, I just wanted to lay out our basic terms. So let's do that. First, let's define language. Now, bear with me, this is a kind of long example, but language is a system of symbolic communication. It is arbitrary, discrete, reflexive, and productive. It deals with meaning, can reference things without stimulus, and is cultural. Finally, it can be naturally acquired and taught and be broken down into smaller units. Basically, language is putting together sounds and or hand signs into sentences to talk about concepts and ideas that are shared by a culture and or a society. For example, if I say this is a book and you can understand English, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, conversely, if I said, Kore wa hon des? and you didn't speak Japanese, you would probably have no idea what I was talking about, even though I was talking about the same concept, the same idea. There is no natural reason why American English put together b u k and Japanese put together h o n to talk about the same thing. Each language, each culture has its own set of sounds, its own set of systems to say essentially the same concept. Now, don't worry if you don't fully grasp the concept right now. I'll go more in depth in later videos about what language is and how it works. For now, I just wanted to give a brief overview of the subject. Inequality comes to us from the Latin word inicalis, and I probably said that incorrectly. Latin is dead. Get over it. But essentially, it meant something that was unequal, unlike, different, etc. It is the opposite of being equal. Now, call me an optimist, but I would like to think that a country such as the United States, which argues that everyone is created equal, shouldn't have to deal with issues of inequality. Now, I'm not going to go into whether or not inequality is an issue in the US. I'm just going to talk about how we perpetuate it without really even thinking about it. Do you remember when I said that language was cultural and acquirable? Well, that's because it is a social phenomenon. As children, we learn our native languages not because we are taught it, but because we grow up in communities in which it's spoken. You learn how to converse with your social group, not because someone taught you, but because you were in the social group. And that's also because communication, I'm sorry, language is our primary mode of communication. So for people in bilingual households, say the mother speaks Spanish, the father speaks English, you don't have to teach the child either one. Simply by speaking that language with and to the child is enough for the child to acquire both of them. You don't ever have to teach it. And since language is a social phenomenon, it, along with everything else that is social, is constructed. That means that we as a society decide the rules and norms that guide our social interactions. Our social and cultural norms are not natural. We may say that they're natural, but that's only because we've been doing it for so long that it's second nature to us. And what's important to realize is that these norms change. Not even 10 years ago, I wouldn't be able to speak to my boyfriend about possibly getting married. I can also remember a time in which 
tattoos were considered taboo. Now, people with tattoos can show them off freely whenever they want, within, of course, the right social circumstance. And that brings me to the concept of social constructivism of language and meaning, which is also the title of a paper written by Chen Bo about the same subject. For the, po for the purpose of this video, I will be focusing on the subject of collective intentionality. It is the intentional state of a group or society desiring, believing, or intending something. If I go back to my book example, what are we intending when we call this a book? Well, we mean that it has pages, it has words, and it's meant to be read. But is there anything inherently bookish about a book? What about a magazine? You know, it has pages, it has words, but for whatever reason, we differentiate between a book and a magazine. At least in English we do. Now, there is some debate in the linguistic community as to whether or not meaning is innate, meaning is hardwired in here somewhere, or it's constructed, which just means that it's made up. I tend to lean more towards the latter. That's because there's nothing logical or natural about calling a book a book. There's really no reason behind using the words that we use. I mean, sure, you could say, well, the proto-Germanic word for something that could be read was book. Okay, but why do those people decide to use it? The, the further you dig, the deeper you dig, the less it kind of makes sense. Through convention, we make up meanings to communicate a societal intent, whether that would be intending to differentiate between a book and a magazine, or intending to differentiate between a black man and a white man. Do y'all remember that incident last summer when a white woman called the police on a black man in Central Park? The woman said while she was being recorded that she was going to call the police and say, quote, there is an African-American man threatening my life. Then while on the phone and still being recorded, mind you, she told the operator, quote, there is an African-American man. He is recording me threatening myself and my dog. Through the recorded footage, we could clearly see that the man was not threatening her or her dog. But what I want you to focus on is the term African American man. What meaning do we as a society intend to say when we say African American man? Now, think about that in the context of threatening to call the police. Now think about it in the context of actually calling the police. Sure, one could say that the woman was simply trying to give an accurate description of the man to the police. But think about that in the broader context of police violence against the African American community. What else could the woman be intending to say? And how would the police interpret that? Well, thank you so much for watching this video. As I said in the beginning, this was just an introduction. It was just to begin to talk about language and inequality and look at the intent behind the words that we use and the meaning that we attribute to these words. This video was heavily inspired by a video done by Abigail Thorne on her channel Philosophy Tube. She talks about text and the meaning behind the text and so many other things that it got me thinking about. Um, my specific field, ling linguistics, and how meaning is applied that way. So please, I will link to her video. Please watch it. It's well researched. It's well edited. It's beautiful. Be on the lookout for part two of this video in which we go into concrete examples of um, how we use language to talk about immigrants, African Americans, Asians, essentially any, minor uh, any minority group, and um, yeah, possibly how to, how to fix it. Now that we know that there's a problem, Let's also talk about how to fix it. She could hardly understand.